Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build this week. I'm going to build the suspension system for the tender. It's a lot of intricate little moving parts. It's kind of the first real mechanism on this locomotive, so should be really cool. Let's go. Here's the wheel sets and bearings where I left them last time. Now it's time to start filling in the middle. In the center here is where the suspension goes on a railroad truck of this style. You can see the springs and everything in the center there, and that's what we'll be building. So it consists of two bars, an upper and a lower, joined by springs and retained by a vertical bearing guide system known as the columns. Like so many of the days of my life, this one begins in the steel scrap bin. I need to make a fixture that's going to hold the shape of those column bearing structures while we do a whole bunch of operations on them. They're a bit of a delicate structure until they're complete, so we need something that's going to hold them in place through a lot of machining, soldering, and other types of operations. This piece was squared up as accurately as I could, and then I drilled some threaded holes in it that's going to be used to hold everything in place. Now I can start work on the columns themselves. The entire suspension is made of brass, and I've got this square bar here that will be used to make the columns. I'm going to chop it up into lengths that are about the width of my vise, which ends up being about three of these columns in a batch. That'll save me some time. Getting the height just right in the vise can be tricky for small parts like this, so adjustable parallels are a real godsend because you can get just the right amount of stick up with as much of the part in the vise as you can get, and then you can tighten the little screws to hold that in position. And then I have just enough sticking up above for me to side mill the profile into these bars. These columns have a T shape to them and the wide part of the T is the actual bearing surface for the structural bars that form the suspension. So by working in batches like this I can speed things up considerably. I'm machining this profile into batches of three or four at a time, as many as will fit in my vise. And then I can go over to the bandsaw and cut them apart to the individual columns that will form the arches at each end of each suspension structure. Back to the mill then, making use of an end stop once again. I sneak up on the dimension of the first one, and then once again I can quickly run through all of the other parts. End stops are really, really powerful when you have to make more than one of a piece like this. So it's a case of machining one end and then flipping it around and machining the other end down to the same DRO value for each piece and they'll all end up identical. I actually missed in the drawings that the thin part of the T at the top is actually supposed to be thinned down before doing all the other steps, so I had to go back and do that as an extra operation. Would have been quicker and easier to do this when the pieces were all still long and joined together. Next, we need some little threaded holes in one end of each piece. These are for fixturing screws for silver soldering the arch shape that we're going to be creating. So once again, I've set up the first one with a square and using the edge finder to find the center of it. And then an end stop combined with the square will make all of the other ones much quicker. These are tiny little threaded holes for some brass screws. I gotta say this new milling machine is really great for these tiny, tiny drills. I'm using all 4,400 of the ripums that you can get with the high speed drive pulley on this machine. For these tiny drills to get the proper surface speed, you really need more like 10 or 15,000, even 20,000 RPM on some of these drills if you do the actual surface speed math for them. I can't do that, of course, on my mill, but 4400 really makes a big difference. Once again, I love me some end stop. End stop and a tiny square that I can slide in there gets the next part set up just like that. Then they all get tapped with a tiny, tiny tap. The final feature is a side hole that is used for fixturing the part to that block that we made at the top of the show. I don't think this hole serves any other purpose. It could be an oil hole, but I think it's mainly just for fixturing the pieces. Speaking of which, I've cut a strip of brass off a larger sheet, and I'm going to make the little cross bars, if you will, that make the arch shape of each of these structures. Once again, I'm making them in a batch of all four, machining this brass strip down to the proper width, cleaning up the edges, etc and then I rough cut these apart into the four separate pieces. These only need to be rough cut. The ends don't need to be machined because we're going to be filing them to a precise fit at the end of this process. So I just rough marked the center of each, and that'll give me a reference for the bolt spacing because the bolt spacing is important, but the length of the parts is not. So I can't use the ends of the parts as reference because they're rough cut and not all the same length. 
Now I can show you how this is going to work. That block that we made at the top of the show is used to screw all of the parts to, and that holds everything in the exact right position. One thing you do a lot when machining scale models is shortening tiny screws. I have an aluminum angle that I use for this purpose. I have a bunch of threaded holes in it for all of the common sizes of tiny screws, and I use a fret saw to shorten the screws rather than any kind of nippers. The saw causes no distortion, and that screw requires no finishing on the end. It can be threaded directly into a part now. And of course, showing that screw to the camera caused me to drop it, and it disappeared forever. So I got to make that one again. These are the sacrifices that one makes as a YouTuber. Finally, I can show you how this all goes together with the newly shortened screws and the little crossbar piece that goes across the top, everything attached to the fixturing block, and that is how it's going to be for silver soldering, which is the next step. Everything gets disassembled once again and dumped in the pickle bath for cleaning before soldering. I made a little strainer out of a chemical resistant plastic bucket to pickle small parts like this in my big tub. Saves me having to have multiple pickling acid containers, but doing these tiny parts, you can't drop them in that big bucket or you'll never find them again. The pieces then get attached to the fixturing block once again, and I flux one joint, but I attach all the pieces together with the screws. So the entire assembly is being held in its final position even though I'm only soldering one joint at a time. This is the classic Kozo method, and I'm going to stick to it because he knows what he's doing. You could conceivably do both of these joints at once. Doing it this way with this angle that you see helps ensure that the solder flows down into the joint with the help of gravity. If you try to do both joints at once, that might be more difficult to do, so that's probably why he has you do it this way. It is more labor intensive, of course. After each joint, you have to take everything apart, and then the other two pieces, which were just effectively placeholders then have to go back in the pickling acid before you can do the other joint. You also have to disassemble everything because that fixturing block cannot go in the pickling acid. It's made of steel and you don't want to put anything ferrous in your pickling acid because that will contaminate it. With all eight joints done that way I now have the four arch structures. They're ready for the next set of finishing operations. These assemblies are my first taste of what I tend to call the Kozo method of fabrication. One of the trademark features of Kozo's locomotives is that he uses no castings. He fabricates everything from bar stock. And the way he does that is by silver soldering assemblies like this and then machining or finishing those assemblies in various ways. That saves you having to make a lot of chips. So these arch structures, for example, if you tried to machine them from a solid billet of material, it would be a lot of chips and a lot of time. But by silver soldering, effectively building a casting of the part from bar stock and then machining that assembly gives you very much the same effect with a lot less time and a lot less material. Final finishing for these consisted of filing the fixturing screw heads off the top and then filing off the excess length of the crossbars and finally filing the T-shaped profile of the columns into the crossbar so that it's one continuous shape down the side of the piece. If you do all this well, then the silver solder joints and everything effectively disappear, and it just looks like one complex brass piece. These are going to be painted as well, so I'm not spending too much time on finishing work. Just don't leave them set up like this too long, or you'll attract tiny druids, and then you can never get rid of them. Finally, we need some threaded holes in the corners of each piece to attach the actual arch bar truck structure to these things. You'll note that I'm actually drilling and tapping through the remains of the little brass fixturing screws that were in there for silver soldering. But that's fine because the pieces are all silver soldered together, so those screws aren't needed anymore. And these new screws are larger than the old ones, so we're effectively eliminating them by doing this. It's a neat technique that I would not have thought of. Next up are the bolsters, which are long bars that go across the truck and form the suspension dividing line. Every suspension system on a car or an airplane or a truck or whatever has a suspension line above which is sprung weight and below which is unsprung weight. In this case, the upper bar or bolster is attached rigidly to the frame of the tender, which suspends the entire weight of the tender above the springs, forming the sprung weight. And then below the springs is the unsprung weight, which is the lower bolster, which attaches to the trucks themselves. So the wheel sets and truck bodies are all unsprung weight. To make these bolsters, I have this brass bar stock that was donated a while back. It's got a lot of crud on it from sitting on the shelf for a really long time. I want to get all of that off first because it's going to interfere with the accuracy of my setups. Then I can rough cut these pieces to length on the bandsaw. 
Then back over to the mill to clean up the ends, bring them down to dimension, and also dimension the z-axis a little bit. The dimensions of the part are close to the standard stock dimensions of this bar stock. This is something that Kozo does a lot. He tends to design his parts such that most of the dimensions match bar stock that you can buy. That saves you a lot of time, and as long as the surface finish and dimensions of the stock that are on the factory surfaces are not super critical, this works just fine. You don't necessarily have to machine every surface of every part. That gives me four blanks now. I've got two for the upper bolsters and two for the lower bolsters, which are thinner. There's a lot of features in common between the upper and lower bolsters, so I can save a lot of time with a setup like this. I've centered everything up with the edge finder, and I've got an end stop on there, and I can put a bunch of features in on both sets of bolsters all in one setup. The first operation is a bunch of center drilling and drilling to an accurate depth to create the spring pockets. This is what holds the top and bottom of each spring in each bolster. These are in the same places on all four bolsters, regardless of size or orientation. So this is very quick to run through all the parts like this. Once again, I'm striking a balance between tool changes and part changes. I'm opting to do the center drilling and drilling on one piece and then switch pieces. If there's tapping involved, I typically do all of that at the end on all pieces because setting up the tapping requires moving the head and often removing the Jacob's chuck and a bunch of other setup work. The upper bolsters get a drilled and reamed hole for the kingpin that's the pivot for each of the trucks. The interesting feature on these is a big chamfer that goes to a very specific depth on each of these. Dimensioning chamfers is always interesting. The way Kozo has decided to do it is he gives you the diameter of the top of the finished chamfer. So the way I'm doing that is sneaking up on it little by little and using a gauge pin to check the diameter. I wasn't sure of a better way to do this, but there's a very generous tolerance on these anyway, so this is certainly close enough. And then once I've done the first one, I have the quill DRO value for how deep to go on the second one. Next comes what's probably the most interesting feature on these bolsters. All four of them need some very tricky angle cuts done. There's some little grooves at the ends of the bolsters that ride on those columns that we made, but those grooves have to have an angle to them, and you'll see why in a moment. I'm going to do this on my little angle table because, well, I have it and I love it, and I'll take any excuse I can to use it. So I tappy tap tap that in nice and straight. Next, I'm going to set the angle to 3 degrees, which is the angle that all of these grooves require. Finally, I'm going to bolt a fence to the back, which is going to help me get repeatability and keep the parts straight. I'm going to have to do a lot of part swapping once again because all four bolsters have a bunch of these angle cuts on them. So I'm tappy tap tapping in that parallel nice and straight. This setup is obviously quite a bit more work than the vise, but it gives me the angle that I need. And with strap clamps and an end stop and that fence, it's going to be repeatable part to part once again. I start by establishing the depth of this slot. The drawings dimension it by giving you the width at the wide part of the taper formed by the two finished slots. I don't have both finished slots, of course, so I'm measuring half that distance at the wide end with a depth mic and sneaking up on that for my first slot. And then once again, I'll have the DRO values to repeat that for all the other slots. Then a series of light cuts widens the slot to final dimension. I'm using a gauge block stack to establish that. This stack is set to the low end of the tolerance on this fit, so I can sneak up on it a little bit at a time with light cuts on both sides until the stack is a nice easy fit in there, and then I know I won't have overshot the tolerance. I centered up this whole fixture on the edge finder initially, so the other slot at the other end is simply the same distance the other way, and to the same depth value on the quill DRO, so that side goes very quickly. These parts are symmetrical on the long axis, so doing the other side is pretty quick and easy with this setup. I can simply flip the part over, use my end stop, and cut the other two grooves on the other side. Got to be a little mindful of which way the parts are facing, of course, to make sure the tapers end up going in the correct direction. That would be a very easy thing to mess up. This is what the completed upper bolster looks like. You can see the tapered slots on the ends. That's part of how the suspension functions. You'll see that in a second. The lower bolsters are skinnier, but they have the same tapered grooves on each end of each side. So those I can cut in this very same setup. 
Now, where things get interesting is the bottom of the lower bolsters need a little peaked groove feature. And this is very tricky to cut. What I've decided to do is mark the center line of where the peak needs to be because the drawing gives the dimension for this as the depth of the cut at that peak. So I milled a little bit at a time until the cut just touched that scribe line. Then I zeroed my depth of cut there and then was able to cut down to the dimension specified on the drawing. And I know that my peak is going to end up in the correct place. I do a cut all the way across, even though the other side is going to get recut because it saves me some effort. I do each end of each part that way, then I flip the parts around to do the other angle. And again, I use the same DRO value because the final depth of cut needs to be the same, it's just the other angle. And you can see, if I did my job right, that we'll end up with a perfect little peak with a three degree angle falling away from each side of that peak in the center. The result might be difficult to see on camera, so I'll show you with the gauge blocks. Gauge block stack goes in, and you see how it rocks back and forth on that peak? That's the movement that the suspension is going to need when this is in its final position. I'll show you how this all works. The columns go over the bolsters like so, forming those bearing surfaces. And you can see how those angles we cut allow the bolsters to rock back and forth. And the peak cut under the lower bolster allows that to rock while sitting against the frame that's going to be down there. A suspension is nothing without springs. I actually made these springs. I'm going to do a separate video on making springs because it's actually a pretty interesting and deep topic all unto itself. But for now, just know that I've made some springs and I'll show you how the final suspension assembly all goes together. The springs sit in the pockets and the bolsters are thus suspended and then the columns go over top and the columns will be bolted to the truck frame thus creating the suspension dividing line that I talked about. Those are pretty stiff, but I can push them a little bit to show you how that works. And once again, you can see the rocking action that's afforded by the tapered cuts, which is what allows the trucks to follow the track. They can tilt as needed to follow the track. Eventually, all this will be painted, but here's a mock-up so you can see how it's going to sit in the final assembly once the truck frames are built. It's starting to look like a railroad car now. We're finally getting somewhere, and this is the first mechanism, if you like, of the locomotive. So it's pretty exciting. Well, that's all the time I have. I hope you've enjoyed this process of making a locomotive tender suspension system. Thanks to my patrons for making all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.